get things kicked off and and uh, we're having one item trying to technical item trying to get an additional speaker off, but I think we can go get go ahead and get started. So um, I will uh, turn it over to uh, Dr. Ani and the engagement committee co chairs who are uh, hosting this meeting. And thank you everyone so much. Great, thanks. So um, my name is uh, Greg Ani. I'm a pediatric oncologist and physician scientist, in San Antonio, Texas. And I'm one of three co-chairs of the Childhood Cancer Data Initiative uh, Working Group Engagement Committee and uh, or Engagement Working Group. And I'm uh, joined here by my two uh, co-chair, two other uh, co-chairs, uh, Dr. Brigitte Wiedemann, who's the Director of Pediatric Oncology at the National Cancer Institute, and Dr. Lee Holman, who's Director of the Osteosarcoma Institute and an adjunct professor at Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. So the engagement committee, uh, we serve as the uh, front door to the childhood cancer, cancer uh, data initiative. Um, and our role is to establish collaboration and engagement with the childhood cancer community, which includes a broad uh, number of individuals, uh, including patients, patient advocates, uh, survivors, researchers, uh, foundations that focus on childhood cancer and pharmaceutical interests. Um, and our overall goal is to understand the landscape of uh, ongoing pediatric oncology research, and most importantly for this initiative to focus on data sharing efforts, what the needs are, and what the opportunities are for the CCDI going forward. Um, for this uh, webinar, we'll be providing an overview of the Childhood Cancer Data Initiative, um, and we will uh, have detailed information on a couple of the uh, specific programs that are part of the CCDI today. Uh, before we go any further, I wanted to give my two co-chairs a chance to provide uh, their comments. And we'll start with Brigitte. Yep. Hi, Dr. Wiedemann. Uh, Brigitte Wiedemann, I'm, I'm very excited to be part of the engagement committee. Um, we know that engaging the entire childhood cancer data community is really important, and we very much look forward to your feedback input not only today but over the years to come thank you hi this is lee hellman i just want to welcome everyone and uh, especially thank the leaders of the ccdi for agreeing to participate in this web uh, uh, webcast and the you know the goal is just to engage as many of, uh, of our advocates and others out in the community to make sure sure we hear everyone's voices as we move forward in this exciting initiative. So thank you all for attending and thanks uh, NCI leadership for um, participating in this event. Great, thanks. Uh, it's a privilege to uh, work with uh, Dr. Holman and Dr. Wiedemann uh, uh, as, as co-chair of this committee. Um, and then today uh, we're joined by uh, three individuals that are leaders that, um, across the CCDI, starting with uh, Dr. Ned Sharpless, who's going to provide an overview. I think it's a great privilege to have him to take time from his busy schedule uh, to update our community uh, on the CCDI. And then we will have uh, two uh, uh, individuals that are leading specific efforts. So first is uh, Dr. Jack Shern, who's going to be sharing uh, information about the molecular characterization protocol. And then we'll finish up with Dr. Lynn Penberthy, who's going to be talking about the National Childhood Cancer Registry or NCCR, as we use for uh, uh, shorthand. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Sharpless to provide his overview. Uh, great, thank you. Good afternoon. I am pleased to have the opportunity to speak to you about the Childhood Cancer Data Initiative or CCDI. Uh, it's a National Childhood Cancer Awareness Month, so it is a great time to recognize the progress we've made against cancer that affect children, but also talk about this specific important NCI initiative that we think will play an important role in our goal. 10 cancers we know it for children and for all Americans. Uh, and by the way, I dug out my like only gold tie for the event. I, I know uh, to commemorate the uh, Childhood Cancer Month and I to show my solidarity in this goal. I'd like to first thank uh, Warren Kibbe uh, uh, for his leadership at the CCDI and uh, greatly appreciate his um, working on this. And he's joined us here today as well. I think Warren's uh, expertise and familiarity with both the extramural world and the uh, intricacies of data science, but also how the NCI works has really been incredibly valuable to have uh, steering this initiative. 
I also want to thank Greg, Brigida, and Lee for organizing this uh, very important opportunity to speak to the extra community. And thank you for all the work you're doing on behalf of this important effort. So as for progress against cancer, I think it's important to say the trends over time over the last few decades have been encouraging. So deaths from cancer among children and teens overall have dropped by more than 50% since around 1980. Take, for example, acute lymphoblastic used to be uniformly fatal in children. And now more than 90% of this uh, children with this disease will survive at least five years and, and the majority will be cured. But the unfortunate truth, there's still far too many children dying of cancer in the United States. Cancer remains the leading cause of death from disease among American children. And even one child dying of cancer is too many from the NCI's perspective. I'm not a pediatric uh, oncologist, but I have treated children with cancer as an adult oncologist, particularly adolescents, and I have witnessed that unique and nearly unfathomable tragedy and devastation that children and their loved ones face upon uh, a, a cancer diagnosis. And this would be, be this in leukemia or sarcoma, the diseases I've treated. And it is um, uh, terrible to have to go through this with one patient, as I said. And for some types of childhood cancer, such as soft tissue sarcoma and uh, central nervous system tumors and, and, and several others, long-term long survival remains challenging and treatment advances have been very limiting. And uh, so there are clearly areas where our progress has not been as good. And even uh, in uh, some cancers where we have seen uh, quite good progress in terms of survival, uh, many survivors of cancer treatment uh, experience lifelong adverse events. They have prolonged consequences from the treatment of their cancer as well as their cancer itself. And this leads to a toll on their physical and emotional health and a shortened life expectancy. So, and, and, and so, you know, we realize that survivorship is as big a problem as, as efficacy in the treatments now for childhood cancer and really want to make progress, not only to have more effective treatments, but less toxic treatments uh, for our children with cancer in the United States. So our, really our goal uh, stated very clearly by President Biden is to end cancers we know it, and that includes ending cancers we know it for children. We want all children to live longer, healthier lives without them ever having, ever having to know the tragedy of cancer. As, ch as cancers go, childhood cancer is, is collectively a, a collection of rare diseases comprising approximately 1% to 3% of cancers diagnosed annually in the United States. This rarity is challenging from a clinical trials perspective. It is uh, difficult to study uh, 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 childhood cancer in sort of large clinical trials the way we would do in a, a more common disease, say lung cancer. And that's really part of the reason why... Um, uh, we thought this initiative was so important. It makes our quest to end childhood cancer very challenging, and we need more data in one place to help all young people with cancer. And this is really where the CCDI comes in. In part, the pace of our progress against childhood cancer has been hindered by the limited availability of certain important types of data and the ability to aggregate and learn from these data. For example, tissue samples from this patient population are limited in availability. Additionally, the clinic and bio, clinical and biological data generated from these samples typically reside in different databases across the country, and they may not be broadly available. And lastly, patient information is often stored at the hospital or institution where the child is treated and not really shared in some way that uh, allows broader research access. And this has made it very difficult for researchers to aggregate and use samples in these data from these collections of rare diseases to understand, understand childhood cancer. And that makes it challenging to develop new ways to prevent, diagnose, and treat cancer. However, these persistent challenges have strengthened the commitment of the research community to discover new ways to cure as many children with cancer as possible and without these long-term side effects that I mentioned. And in my view, we are taking the necessary steps to achieve that end, and the Childhood Cancer Data Initiative is a central part of those efforts. CCDI is helping to jumpstart a radical transformation in the collection and pooling of data on children with cancer as well as an expanded ability to share these data for researchers across the entire scientific community, often for uses that we can't even conceive of presently. I've met with researchers from across the, across the country who, spe who specialize in childhood cancer, and I can confirm that, like me, they're very excited about these efforts to advance childhood cancer research. What we see today with CCDI really began to take shape back in July 2019 when researchers, advocates, and many others came together to brainstorm ways to develop more efficient and effective means of collecting, analyzing, and sharing the data needed to speed progress against cancers that occur in children and adolescents and young adults. CCDI builds on a long tradition of NCI-supported research to advance progress in childhood cancer, and these activities have been further advanced by the passage of the STAR Act, a federal law enacted in 2018 to accelerate progress 
against childhood cancers and to promote pediatric survivorship research. Note that the NCI and NIH are also actively engaged in implementation of the Gabriella Miller Kids First Pediatric Research Program, which I think is familiar to this group, a trans NIH initiative devoted to exploring common genetic predisposition within various childhood cancer syndromes and structural birth defects. The goals of the Gabriella Miller Kids First uh, Pediatric Research Program include generating comprehensive genomic characterization across pediatric cohorts with a known or suspected genetic role or a somatic role in the tumors. And to that end, whole genome sequencing of patient tissues along with data is critically important. And so these efforts are in line with the goals of the CCDI. The CCDI really uh, plans to deliver on additional goals. We want to gather data from every child, adolescent, young adult diagnosed with pediatric cancer, regardless of where they receive their care. And Lynn Penberthy will tell us uh, some about her work in that regard. We want to create a national strategy of appropriate clinical and molecular characterization to speed diagnosis and inform treatment for all types of pediatric cancer. And Dr. Shearn, Jack Shearn's talk will touch on that. And to develop a plat, and the third goal is to develop a platform of and tools to bring together clinical care and research data that will improve preventative measures, treatment, quality of life, survivorship, and survivorship for pediatric cancers. And this is very complicated. This involves building that necessary plumbing and infrastructure that allows for these data to be maximally useful. As we make progress toward these goals, one of the most important things we're doing is building a diverse community of professional expertise centered around childhood cancer care and research data. This community will enable broad participation in the CCDI and will be made up of experts including advocates and pediatric oncologists and researchers and data scientists and all these groups that represent the uh, children, adolescents, and young adults that we're serving. It will also make it possible to share clinical data and research data generated by children's hospitals and clinics and networks and to share those data broadly, which can help us, help us learn faster on a scale much larger than we would get by measuring data of any single institution caring for children on its own. So through CCDI, we are also building what is needed to make childhood cancer data much easier to access, share, and link to other data to power this robust analysis that has not been possible before. So one major component uh, that will transform access to data is the National Childhood Cancer Registry. And as mentioned, Dr. Lynn Pidberthy uh, will we'll talk on this shortly. This registry is, registry is collecting and linking data on diagnosis, outcomes, treatments, and long-term side effects for nearly every child with cancer in the United States. And our goal is every child with cancer in the United States. The availability of these data will have tremendous benefits. It can help provide answers to questions that can't necessarily be addressed through clinical trials because of the rarity of these, these, these conditions and the, the intractability to some of the studies that we're talking about. Collecting comprehensive data from as many children as possible will allow the research community to more thoroughly understand how well these treatments work. And in real world populations, what really happens in children in the community outside of the context of clinical trials. This will also make it easier for researchers to monitor the health of survivors of childhood cancer throughout their lives, providing further insights into the impact of cancer and its treatments on long-term outcomes. Another CCDI component, which Jack Sheeran will speak about in greater de depth, will facilitate the collection of tumor tissue from children with cancers where such tissue for research is lacking or inadequate. Researchers will then perform in-depth molecular characterizations of this tissue, and one of the big goals here is to figure out what is that standard in-depth molecular characterization that we feel we need on all patients. Those data can then be shared with the oncologists to help enroll kids in precision medicine trials and to guide their care, and can also be available to researchers to try and advance our knowledge in, about cancer biology in children. Having access to such comprehensive information that is linked to each patient's clinical data will really, I believe, provide unprecedented insight into the drivers of childhood cancer and how they determine outcome and prognosis, and will really allow us to understand issues like survivorship and causes of childhood cancer and the risks of treatment, et cetera. So it can only, and it can also help identify powerful combinations of targeted therapies, which I believe will be critical to improving outcomes. So in short, having these kinds of data from children with cancer has been a long-term top priority of the cancer research community, including the pediatric cancer research community. And we are now through CCDI making this a reality. We believe CCDI will have a great impact in our ability to prevent diagnosis and treat cancer in adolescents, young adults with cancer, as well as to ensure that researchers learn from every child with cancer, the critical goal of the CCDI. We also believe that what we learn from CCDI can serve as a model to improve what we do with the rest of the NCI. We can, what we learn about data sharing and data aggregation from the CCDI, we eventually will be able to use in adult cancers to make progress for all patients with cancer. So CCDI is not really think, we, we think is not only benefiting our childhood cancer research, but it's benefiting all the goals of the NCI. 
So CCDI is not only about learning to make the future better, we also want to help those children and, uh, and young adolescents with cancer now. The data collected through the CCDI will better inform how clinicians treat all of their patients. And this is really just the beginning. We will continue to work together for years to come, building our community through CCDI. As Helen Keller famously said, alone we can do so little, together we believe we can do so much. I am excited about the progress we've made already and what we will achieve as we harness the power of the community and resources. I know that together we can reach that day when children, adolescents, and young adults and their families no longer need to know the tragedy of cancer. So that includes, includes my remarks. I thank you very much for your time and attention, and I'm very eager to participate in today's discussion. So thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sharpas. That was a wonderful overview. And, and I think I speak on behalf of, you know, many of the advocates, uh, parents and patients that I know were probably on this call that I think it's, it's phenomenal to have an NCI director that's so dedicated to childhood cancer um, because I, I, I think there's, is such a great need for research going forward. And this data initiative, I think, just has tremendous potential. And we really appreciate you taking the time to, to be here today and be a part of this. Um, so next up, we're going to have uh, Dr. Jack Stern, who's going to share uh, some information about the molecular characterization protocol. Dr. Stern. Hey, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to uh, come talk today. Um, I think there's some slides to pull up. Um, I'll quickly introduce myself. I'm in the pediatric oncology branch. I'm a, a clinician, but also a translational researcher. I run a laboratory here. And I'm uh, representing today uh, uh, our, our group, the Molecular Characterization Protocol. I am co-chair of this with uh, Dr. Malcolm Smith and Dr. Katie Janeway. Uh, the next slide. So briefly, I just want to give an overview of what we've been working on, um, and I will talk a lot about this molecular characterization protocol and describe what we're doing and what that is, why the molecular characterization protocol is so important to the overall CCDI, and how the uh, molecular characterization protocol addresses the goals of the broader CCDI. And then finally, just uh, some thoughts about how this will improve our understanding of childhood cancer going forward. And I hope in the discussion that follows this, we'll have some opportunity to go into some of the questions that you might have about this. Uh, next slide. So we were really charged in, in our uh, protocol with coming up with a national strategy uh, to uh, build on the efforts that, of the children's oncology group that they had put together in a project called Project Every Child. And what we really wanna do is offer appropriate clinical and molecular characterization to every child with cancer. Across the country, everyone should get a minimum set of molecular diagnostics, and that this should be collected on every patient that comes through our clinics. Uh, our protocol is uh, rolling out with a goal of characterizing about 3,000 children, and we really wanna be accessible to all children with cancer including those that are treated in community-based institutions outside of the big academic centers that treat a lot of our patients. This will provide access to underserved children and support uh, care for, for all of the children that get cancer in the United States. Um, a second charge of this is really to enable discovery. So as we generate this data and connect them, we really wanna align the molecular um, uh, data that we are generating with other clinical databases. And then finally, to continue to build the sample biobank so that we can really start to do future discovery research to look for new targets and new therapies for our patients. Next slide. So let me take a step back and get on the same page here. What does molecular characterization really mean? So to the oncologists and the pathologists that see these diseases, molecular characterization is a process where we learn something about the patient's tumor at a much more fundamental level. Uh, molecular characterization is, as you might understand it, is a laboratory test that gets sent on tumor tissue or on a patient sample. And we uh, very frequently will profile things to gain further information, such as DNA, RNA, or even proteins. And a common example of this that sort of everyone thinks and knows that we're working on in CCDI is to generate genomic sequencing data about the tumors and specifically the childhood tumors. Next slide. 
So what does molecular characterization look like for pediatric patients? On the patient level, we want this molecular characterization to really teach us about the specific cause of a particular patient's tumor and what keeps that tumor growing and how we might think about treating that specific patient. On a broader level, molecular characterization allows us to look for specific changes that might occur in families. You might think about things that might predispose a particular family to developing cancer. And then on an even broader level, how this might help the, the treatment team that's taking care of that patient. How do they select the appropriate therapy based on what is found about that specific patient's tumor? And since these um, errors occur in the DNA, the RNA, or the proteins, any uh, sort, uh, multiple sorts and assays can be used to molecularly characterize these tumors. Next slide. So how is this important and what are we actually doing? So again, we're working on the patient specific level. And for this, we want to profile about 3000 patients with the goal of within two weeks time, performing the molecular characterization of the tumors that we've prescribed and then returning that data immediately to the treatment team and the patient. And this would allow that treatment team again to make important diagnostic information, prognostic information, and then to think about what the appropriate therapy is for that particular patient. And what we've laid out and prescribed as, uh, as we roll this out for the data to be collected, at the DNA level, we are doing what's called CLIA, so a validated laboratory assay, whole exome sequencing. That's what WES stands for. So whole exome sequencing, we're looking at all the genes across the tumor, as well as in the patient's germline. So in their, in their blood, uh, normal uh, cells, looking for any changes that might have predisposed that patient to cancer. At the RNA level, we're looking for particular driver mutations. So things like fusion genes that drive many of our pediatric cancers, we'll be able to quickly diagnose that and return that information to the treatment team. Methylation is another way that we look at DNA. And so we're performing a, a genome-wide methylation array. And then this genomic and molecular data that we'll assemble is being linked to the Children's Oncology Group's uh, Project Every Child, where they're collecting deep clinical annotation about each of these patients. So we think that's an important first step. It's important for the patient, as well as uh, informing the mechanism of how these tumors occur in our patients. But we also want to sort of push the limits in the in the broader CCDI. And so uh, in this process, we'll be generating a large biobank of, of repository of samples. And we have our eye towards what assays need to be performed where we would push the limits and make new discoveries about these tumors. Currently, we're talking about uh, whole genome sequencing is a, a obvious way that we can do this. And then for, um, on the clinical side, collecting more longitudinal data. Uh, currently, we collect a lot of information of patients as they walk in the door, and then we sort of lose them over time. We're interested in collecting longitudinal data as the patient undergoes treatment. And so that's an important aspect of what we're, trying, what we're trying to accomplish. Next slide. So how does this fit into the broader CCDI? Um, we think collecting data about the individual's tumors will allow us to learn and help specific patients and families sort of real time. Uh, again, we're delivering this information back to the clinic in real time. Um, and then on the broader aspect, we think collecting data from many children and then comparing these, these data allows the research community to, to, to start to discover new trends in how these cancers arise and how they behave, especially as we treat them. Um, in alignment with the CCDI objectives, all the data that we're collecting here will be sort of immediately shared. And uh, together, we think that this deep, comprehensive molecular profiling and sharing of the data will drive new discoveries and new mechanisms of disease, new cancer targets, and development, obviously, of, of more effective therapies and treatments is our ultimate goal. Next slide. So where are we uh, today in that process? Uh, we're, we're, we have built a significant infrastructure to help support this. There are some details that need to be worked out, um, and this is what our group is actively working on 
issues uh, such as how to consent patients and their families to get this sort of information collected and generated. How do we uh, um, return the results of the genomic and molecular profiling that we do to the treating physician? The logistics of that are, uh, are still being worked out. What are the actual sample requirements? So when a sample is taken from a, a, a remote site and then brought uh, centrally for molecular profiling, how do we need to have that sample handled? And then when we generate all this data and start to merge it, where do we store it? How do we share it most um, uh, conveniently for the research community are all questions that our, um, our group is working on. And so I think that's my last slide. Um, so I will sort of stop there and throw it back to Greg. Thanks, Dr. Shearn. So I, I think the other thing was I would note is that uh, there's questions on any of the three presentations we'll, we'll discuss, we, we'll take those at the end. Um, so next up we have uh, Dr. Lynn Penberthy, who's gonna talk to us about the National Childhood Cancer uh, Registry. Good afternoon. Um, just want to confirm that my sound is all right. We can hear you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so, so thanks so much for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today about the National Childhood Cancer Registry. Next slide, please. So the objectives really today are to describe the NCCR and some of its key components to explain why the NCCR is important to the Childhood Cancer Data Initiative and to provide you with an example that illustrates how the NCCR data might improve our understanding of childhood cancer. Next slide, please. The NCCR is a centralized infrastructure that brings together uh, much existing data on all cancer patients aged zero to 39. The core data or the base data for this are derived from cancer registries. And what we're doing with the NCCR is taking the data from registries and extending it and expanding it to include additional relevant information, such as longitudinal detailed treatment, characterization of the tumor from a genomic perspective, identifying risk of recurrence and recurrence episodes, and then also identifying subsequent primary cancers in these children as they age. The goal of this is really to capture the complete trajectory of care for, from diagnosis throughout the patient's life. Right now, we include patients that represent uh, almost 80% of all childhood cancers in the U.S., with 21 state cancer registries participating. However, in the next year or two, we'll be expanding that to get as close to 100% of all cancer patients as possible for childhood, AYA, and young adults. I wanted to take a moment and just make sure that people uh, understand what a cancer registry is, because I think this is very important. Registries collect, store, and manage data on every person with cancer from diagnosis until death. And this is important, they are population-based. So that means that the registries capture all cancers within a defined geographic area. And they have the legal authority, typically through state regulation, that allows them to capture data on every one of these cancer cases. And in fact, every state has a uh, legal mandate that requires all healthcare providers to report information on cancer patients to these state cancer registries. Next slide, please. The components of the NCCR are really established through routine linkages that we perform um, typically centrally with both uh, internal and external data sources. And these include starting with complete registry abstracts for each cancer case from 1995 through the current data. We also capture information on survival data from the National Death Index, as well as from state vital records. We're linking with um, information to capture residential history. This is important because it's an essential to be able to have us link data over time as patients experience treatment or recurrence, and also subsequent cancers or adverse effects of treatment. And so we have to have a match on that address as people migrate over time. The third, um, routine linkage that we perform is what through the virtual pooled registry or VPR. This is actually a national system of virtual connections for all state cancer registries. And it supports deduplication of cases for pediatric cancer because as you know, many pediatric patients may receive care in multiple states. And so we have to be able to deduplicate that information and consolidate that information. 
It also allows us to capture information on subsequent cancers as patients age. Next slide, please. We routinely link with many external data sources as well. Um, the first of these is pharmacy data, and these are real-time data feeds from pharmacies such as CVS, Walgreens, and Rite Aid, as well as from United Healthcare Pharmacy Benefit Management data. This is important because it provides information on oral antineoplastic therapy, which is becoming increasingly used, particularly to treat recurrent disease. We capture longitudinal radiation oncology treatment data, and it's important to note that we're capturing these data not just on the initial course of therapy, but also on treatment of recurrence if a patient should have a recurrence. We use claims data and linkages from United Healthcare, Medicaid, et cetera, to capture treatment information such as infusion-based chemotherapy, surgery, et cetera, and to also be able to identify comorbid conditions, both pre-diagnostic as well as post-diagnostic and treatment. We're beginning to capture radiology reports and images um, that we use both for case finding as well as for identification of occurrence because radiologic imaging is often the initial uh, mechanism by which uh, recurrence is diagnosed. And then, of course, genomic data, as um, uh, Jack just mentioned, this enables us to better classify the cancers and to help us understand if there are disparities in outcomes for, pan for cancers, patients who may have the same treatment. Next slide. So this is a fairly uh, complicated slide, but I just wanted to take a minute to show this because I think it really illustrates the complexity of the infrastructure that we're trying to put together. So if you could click again. Um, this, uh, the, the data sources on the left are really data sources that are currently and commonly used that I talked about. Next click, please. Um, these are new data sources on the right, um, which are either now being linked or we're proposing to link over the next year or two to help us support the centralized infrastructure. And click once more, please. And the centralized infrastructure will be um, combined data from registries and all of the linked sources that will be available for researchers in a secure data platform that will allow us to better understand cancer in pediatric patients as well as AYA and young adult populations. Next slide. So the MCCR is supported and guided by multiple working groups. Um, the first of these is a broad general scientific working group, and that includes clinicians, epidemiologists, advocates, IRB members, and also representing cancer centers and registries. Many of the participants of this broad work group are also participating in our focus working groups, of which we have three. The first is the metadata working group, which um, is helping us to harmonize existing data across these multiple and disparate data sources and recommending new data items that the registries should collect because they're essential for helping us to understand cancer in these patients. The second working group is the data access and release working group, and this is very important because they're helping us to develop processes for appropriate data release and access to researchers while maintaining patient privacy and confidentiality. The third working group is the data products working group, and as Dr. Sharpless alluded to, this is helping us to inform key analyses and to help us develop data sets that will um, be accessible to uh, researchers to, again, help us understand cancer in uh, patients, pediatric patients. Next slide. So why is the NCCR important? Well, we think it's important because it provides patient-level data to help us understand cancer in every child, not just children who are seen at COG facilities or state-of-the-art cancer centers, but every child. The data will be accessible on how patients are diagnosed, treated, and their associated outcomes. And it will really serve as a measurement of how well we're doing in reducing mortality from childhood cancers over time. We want to continue to have that trend for reduction in mortality, and this is a mechanism by which we can monitor that. It also allows us to answer important questions, such as where do we need to focus attention to improve outcomes? Who may not be participating in clinical trials or receiving state-of-the-art care at COG facilities? And importantly, how far are patients having to travel to receive that care, as well as many other questions. Next slide, please. So how does the MCCR fit into the Childhood Cancer Data Initiative? We think that it provides valuable data on every child, adolescent, and young adult with cancer related to the diagnosis, treatment, and survivorship, and helping to direct the focus of the CCDI activities. For example, MCCR data could guide the molecular characterization protocol showing where we have the most opportunity to have an impact. 
it could direct CCDI to focus on patients who may not have access, as I mentioned earlier, to clinical trials or COG facilities and their state-of-the-art care. Next slide. So this slide is really um, an example of how the data from NCCR can be helpful and important, and essentially providing a report card. And this is leukemia as an example. And so what this graphic represents is um, leukemia by race and ethnicity shown in the different colored lines. The horizontal axis is age of diagnosis by year, and the vertical axis is incidence rates per 100,000 population. <clears throat> and so what's important here is that we can see that under the age of seven is really the peak for leuke leukemia in these children. However, once the, um, the patient reaches age eight or nine, it tends to be fairly flat in terms of the incidence. But what is also important is that this clearly points out that the Hispanic population, as represented by the light blue line on the top, continues to maintain a higher incidence rate than either white or African-American populations. And so these kinds of graphics and statistics help us to monitor the progress or provide a report card on the impact of clinical care um, over time. And it helps us to identify groups of patients who may not be experiencing the benefit of the new treatments by age, by racial and ethnic subgroups, or even by geographic area. And um, I just wanted to mention that the trends that you see here for incidents were also developing for mortality and survival. And in fact, the website that you see at the very bottom left-hand corner of this slide is a statistical report um, that has many, many more such graphics um, that is on the SEER website. And in fact, we're developing an interactive tool that will allow us to allow the user, um, which could be any of you, to develop such graphics to look at particular trends in which the researcher or uh, investigator is interested. Next slide, please. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Great, thank you for that uh, wonderful overview of the NCCR. So, uh, um, and, and thanks to all three presenters. Uh, we have about, uh, now we have about 20 minutes left in our webinar time, uh, during which we um, encourage questions. And I wanna remind everybody that you can ask questions in the chat box as well. So I don't know if anybody has a question. If not, I'll, um, I can start with one. Um, um, and, and perhaps this is most appropriate for um, Dr. Pemberthy, but how are parents going to enroll their child uh, on the, in the CCDI? Uh, so um, just to clarify, so this is the National Childhood Cancer Registry and patients do not get enrolled because it's not a clinical trial or a study. This is the um, NCCR operates under public health reporting. So very similar to the COVID reporting that you may all be familiar with. Um, there is a state law in every state, as I mentioned, that requires healthcare providers to report information on cancer patients to that state central cancer registry. And so um, we at NCI receive de-identified data from the registries uh, as a limited data set, which has dates. And those are uh, structured in such a way as to protect confidentiality, but to make those accessible to researchers to be able to answer important questions. Did that address your question? Yeah, I think it's, it's important to make a distinction between the, you know, how someone, how a patient would get into the registry versus being included in the, the overall CCDI. I think you did that. Um, so uh, another question is, um, I think this is a, a broader question, perhaps one for Dr. Sharpless, but is will the NCI continue CCDI if Congress has not approved funding for it next year or any subsequent years? Because it's a it's a ten year program, uh, I think on the books, and I think we're currently in year uh, two of ten. Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. I mean, uh, the the NCI's commitment to childhood cancer research goes beyond uh, any specific appropriation from Congress and we'll, we'll have a very strong commitment to childhood cancer research no matter what happens next year. But funding is important. We need Congress to appropriate monies for this. Uh, and, um, and uh, you know, uh, support for the program is, is really critical to its, you know, really getting it done in a quick and nimble way. Uh, I think the good news here is that Congress is, seems uh, pretty supportive of cancer research in general and, and, and particularly supportive of childhood cancer research. And uh, so far, my sense is that this initiative is very popular on both sides of the aisle because 
I think the, the goals of the initiative are really clear. It's, it's to try and, you know, do better, faster, quicker for all children with cancer uh, using uh, data that is not widely available today, but we all believe should be available. And, and that's a mission and a goal that is very popular. I think you could, many of you can probably remember Vice President Biden when he was first standing up the moonshot, spoke at length about data sharing and how this was problematic and how we have to do better. And so this is really grabbing that data sharing problem by the horns and wrestling it to the ground. And we think childhood cancer, for the reasons I mentioned, is an excellent place to start. So in short, in summary, the answer to the question is yes, this, this requires continued support from Congress. Although even if Congress never gave us another nickel, we're still gonna care about childhood cancer. But um, uh, the good news there, I think, is that this is very popular with Congress because it's a very important initiative. Hey, Greg, can I just add a comment about the first question? So I, I, I would just say to the patients on the call or the advocates as a, as a co-chair of the engagement committee with you and Brigida, um, I, you know, I, I would say that when you are seen, you should ask your caregiver about the CCDI and you would like to know about it. And if possible, you would like to have your child participate. And we'd also like to know if you don't want to participate, we'd like to know why you don't want to participate because you heard two, both Dr. Sharpless and I think Dr. Shuren say, we want to include all children and we don't want to exclude people. And so I think asking about the CCDI and getting back to us so we understand if you want to participate and can't, what's the problem? And if you don't want to participate, what's the problem? So we can be as broad as possible in this incredible opportunity. Great, thanks. So that was, uh, I think, a really good point to, to bring up. There's a, a couple of uh, questions that I've, I've just noted. The first one, I'm not sure who to direct this to, but perhaps um, Dr. Schoen or Dr. Hellman even and, and, doc, and Dr. Wiedemann. Uh, so there's a question about um, diet and microbiome, microbiome have uh, there's a lot of research in that area and its impact on cancer and cancer response. Will any of that data be collected as part of the CCDI? I can start. Um, so the fastest way for us to get this up and running, as I said, is to link up and partner with the Children's Oncology Group Project Every Child. And the reason why that's fastest is because they've put together a very nice protocol that collects this sort of detailed clinical information. I am not, uh, I, don't, I do not think that there are many questions about diet and microbiome on there, but we are certainly looking to sort of readdress that deep profiling, that clinical profiling, that as you sort of make your point here, you know, maybe something diet and microbiome can be very important and we'd like to collect that. And then the other point is, there are efforts within the broader CCDI and other ideas for how to use the medical record. So if your doctor is collecting such sort of uh, detailed clinical annotation about something specific about your diet, how can we grab that data and then integrate it into what we're doing? And so I think that's another powerful part of the CCDI where we could really start to make these very uh, fine questions much more granular and much more answerable. Perhaps if I could chime in on that, I mean, I think um, we believe there are data that are molecular in nature that are we, we need to be getting on every kid really to make a decision on how to treat them. That's, you know, DNA and some RNA, maybe DNA methylation in some instances that in some expression of protein markers. There's some things that we have to have really to provide good care. And that's we want to identify that minimal set that we think we need to get on every kid. And then in addition to that, there are data beyond that that might be super important. We don't know yet. They're not clinically validated. They're the future. And we think, you know, that's made perhaps more genomic sequencing. That's something like, you know, detailed microbiome information about a patient. And those kinds of questions we intend to test in kind of a pilot fashion by funding specific smaller initiatives to see if these, these other things really add additional information. I share the questions enthusiasm for microbiome research. I think that, you know, there's in interesting data that microbiome dictates response to certain kinds of agents like immunotherapy. And so that is, a, you know, a hypothesis that needs further exploration and testing. But we don't think that's got it right now in 2021 is part of the minimal set that we need to collect on everybody, but it might be elevated to that status with further study. So that's so the CCDI is not about solely collecting the right information today, but figuring out what's the right information we need for the future. 
Yeah, this is Warren. Just to, to add on onto that, one of the reasons that we thought the methylation data was so important is that's influenced by, both by diet and microbiome, and that that may give us a hint. In fact, if if um, either diet or, or microbiome is is important in understanding some of these 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 uh, different patients and with different diseases, so I think that gives us a, a window into how to address exactly that question. Perfect. Thanks. So, one thing that I have a, um, a specific question for Dr. Stern: Can, can you? Um, speak to how patients would specifically get enrolled on the molecular characterization, how that would happen, just as a way to kind of explain to the community and the potential patients out there how that would, would happen. Absolutely. So as this rolls out, I uh, uh, keep mentioning this COG project every child, but every one of your treating oncologists will know about that COG protocol. We are rolling this out to, uh, to that protocol and the infrastructure that's associated with it. So as a patient is diagnosed, we would envision them being co-enrolled on this project every child and their treatment protocol. So um, that is sort of our mechanism. And if you go to your treating oncologist and say, I'm interested in project every child, they will find a way to get you enrolled. And that's how you get, you get started in this. Obviously, as we roll this out, there will be particular um, uh, disease focuses where we think we can make the quickest progress with that. And that's uh, uh, what we have sort of in the immediate future. Um, so, yeah, I think I think the treating oncologists were doing quite a bit of um, uh, work to try and engage them um, and make sure that they know about this effort, because the reality is, is we will be returning this. And this sort of gives great value back to the treating physician, too. You know, it's more information for them and more information for the families. And so we envision that as sort of a, a real driver of, um, of interest in this protocol. And then, and then I think a, a really important follow up question that people may also be wondering about is. Um, if a patient's data goes into the CCDI. Does the, does the patient or their family have access to that data going forward? And how will that be taken care of? Yeah, so the the at least from the genomic side of things and the molecular characterization that we're doing, uh, one of the the real challenges to this was that remember that word I said CLIA. Um, we want to generate data that is so robust and so trustable that that can be returned sort of immediately to the patient. And so yes, when we generate this data, there will be. Uh, uh, detailed genomic information that will be returned to your treating oncologist as well as to the family, and that will be sort of yours to keep. Now, the broader data that gets generated along that, uh, along with that, in the uh, bigger context will be de-identified. Um, but I think, you know, again, if you enroll on these protocols, part of that consent process is this is your data and, um, and you want to return that. I, th I think it's probably important to mention, and Warren could probably elaborate better than I, but there are different kinds of data in the CCDI. So there's patient specific, like this, the, your tumor's genome, and obviously our intent is to return that to the patients, and that's why we have this CLIA problem that uh, Jack mentioned. It's a, it's a, it makes it harder, but the reason to do it is then we can give those data back to the patients and the doctors can use those data for clinical decision making. So it's a worthwhile to do that. And part of the thing we're interested in knowing is how do those such data get used when they are returned to the patient and the doctors who make clinical decision making. But we have other kinds of data, the kinds that Dr. Penberthy talked about that are collected through large registries. And these are de-identified data and these are collected uh, on all populations of individuals with cancer. And uh, those data can be very, very useful as well but those are not easily returned and assigned to a specific individual. And in fact, protecting the privacy of individuals within those data sets is absolutely key. Protecting everybody's privacy who participates in the CDC CDI is absolutely key. But you can see the different kinds of data have different challenges with regard to sharing. And that's why this is hard. That's, you know, working this out in a way that allows us to use those data for research so that we can learn from every child, but at the same time, protect every child's anonymity is really hard, but it's doable. And we, the CCDI is well on the road to building that vision where we can give data back 
for users in clinical decision making, but also learn at the population health level about how best to take care of children with cancer. And Warren can probably describe those those speed and those gar those guard speed bumps and, and guardrails that we put up to make this possible. I could attempt to do better than what you just said, Ned, but I don't think I can. That was great. So I, I think another thing, just thinking about what, what we've discussed thus far, that you know, uh, another question that may be out there is, um, uh, Dr. Shern mentioned, you know, Children's Oncology Group and Project Every Child, I think, a, a number of times. But how is the data initiative going to interface with some of the larger institute institutions or other cooperative groups, such as St. Jude, Dana Farber, or you know, some of the smaller? Um, clinical trials consortiums like Poetic or NANT new, uh, that are out there. Well, I can I can start with that. It, obviously, it's a that that's a, a a big and really important question. You've already heard um, Dr. Shern talking about the about COG and, and making sure that in fact we use Project Every Child <clears throat> from a, a a consenting standpoint and making sure that we're working tightly with with um, the Children's Oncology Group. Um, we're also working with the Child Brain Tumor uh, Network to make sure that those children and the, the people involved in that are, are engaged. Um, <clears throat> and, and of course, working with St. Jude's. Uh, so so we, we are engaging with many different networks. There are many out there. Um, and we'd love to work with, with everyone. So the, the door is open. And, uh, and and we're we're both um, reaching out, and we're happy to uh, to to have people reach out to us. And this is Brigitte. Maybe I I want to add that, as you know, was mentioned several times today. This is really for every child with cancer. This includes the rarest types of cancers, and they are. I think advocacy groups can be extremely helpful because they can engage patients and get them, for example, to project every child where we might be able to capture, let's say the 20 or 30 kids that are diagnosed with a specific cancer in the United States in a year. And let's just imagine how much we could learn from these patients if we were to get them to project every child and to the CCDI molecular characterization project. I, I think that's one of the areas where advocacy um, can be tremendously helpful to advance the learning for these patients. And I, I know that we all believe this, and it's really through that learning that we understand how to give better treatments to, to future patients. And that's obviously, that's just a cornerstone of everything we're doing. It, it's not just a learning from every child, it's really so that enables us to do a better job in the future. So I, so I think with that in mind, and thinking about how does, the CCDI, how are we going to interact more with the advocates and the whole pediatric cancer community? I think at the beginning of this, I mentioned that the engagement working group is really envisioned as kind of the front door to the CCDI for those groups. And and, and I think going forward today, we've had an example, you know, of two examples of, I, I think, initiatives within CCDI that have had a lot of momentum initially and have, you know, some concrete um, you know, uh, plans going forward that have really taken shape and there'll be a lot more of that to come in, in the coming months and years. And, and it's our intent that the engagement working group will be, you know, a kind of the point group for the community overall researchers, advocates, uh, anyone that may be interested in, in what the, the inner workings of the CCDI uh, are and, and going forward to, to really just help build this effort. And, you know, I think achieve the mission that uh, Dr. Kibbe just mentioned of w which is you know it, improving um, you know outcomes and lessening the, the late effects and improving survivorship for these patients which I know everybody on this call today is really that's that's what they're mostly interested in and I, and I think uh, we wanted to try to give some you know communication on what's happening so far um, and, and and where we're headed in the future and just to close I wanted to once again thank everybody for their participation. Thank everybody that's uh, on the call for their participa participation as well. 
And uh, we look forward to uh, interacting with you in the future as this effort evolves and uh, gains more momentum. Yeah, can I just add, Greg, um, just remember, and you've heard everyone say this, this is about helping patients. At the end of the day, we're doing this all. We're most, many of us are pediatric oncologists and we wanna see better results. And as Dr. Sharpless said, not just better survivorship, but a better quality of life as we can minimize the, what, what the price we know we have to pay currently. So, but this is for patients and the engagement committee wants to hear from you. We don't wanna say this is, we wanna hear from you and tell us what you need so we can do our best to make sure we are working together, not just from on high, but this is in the end, it's all about our patients. Dr. Wiedemann, do you have any final remarks and then we'll end. I would like to thank NCI for organizing this today and for everyone who participated. We really look forward to engaging with you and there will be ample opportunity. We have a lot of work to do and look forward to it. Thank you. Great. Dr. Sharpless, do you have any final remarks since you're the head guy? <laughs> no, nothing to add. I think Lee said it best. This is about patients. And you, he's right. You got to tell us what, what tell us what we need to do. I mean, I, I think this is why we're we had the engagement committee to, to to find out from the community what we need to do differently and what we need to do more of. And so, please uh, don't be a stranger. Reach out and let us know because it's all about ending cancer suffering for children. So, thank you again for the opportunity to come speak today. Great, thank you. And with that, we will uh, formally close the webinar. Bye, bye, everybody.